So let's talk some more about dielectrics. In this case we're going to talk about this vector D and I remind you about dum de dee dum dum with emphasis on the D's. What is D? The electric field generated by polarized material is equal to the electric field produced by its bound charges. If free charges are present then the total electric field produced is equal to the vector sum of the E fields produced by the bound charge. So here's E total, here's the bound charge, and here's the free charge E's. The thing to remember is that we know this is a source of E field, but also the bound charge is a source of E field. So what that means is that we can use Gauss's law as long as we take into account both types of charge. Quite often we'll have the symmetries needed in both cases where we can use Gauss's law. So the electric displacement vector comes out of this approach. If we take the differential form of Gauss's law, as you remember, the divergence of V is equal to rho over epsilon. And all in the past we just used the free rho. But now we use the bound and the free charge densities. So we add those two together. We write the bound charge in terms of its definition which is given here. The bound charge density is minus the divergence of capital P which is the polarization. We add then the free row and so we're just rewriting this equation with the bound charge as it was defined. If we take the term that had the divergence of E and just add del cross P obviously taking into account the epsilon zeros, we then end up with this quantity here equaling the free charge density. So all we've done is solve this for the free charge density, bringing this into the quantity which we're going to take the divergence of. Then we see that we've got some vector here. This vector shows up frequently when we have dielectrics. So we give it a name, it's called D, capital D, and it's the electric displacement vector. D is equal to epsilon zero capital E plus P. So you can see it contains the total E field, which remember is dependent upon both the free charge and the bound charge. We add in the polarization here. In terms of D, we can rewrite Gauss's law in terms of D. And so that's equal to the free charge density up here. Here's D. So we take the divergence of D and we get the free charge density. And so we call that Gauss's law for D in differential form. Or we can use the divergence theorem and get it in terms of a surface integral, which is what we did for E when we derived Gauss's law. That is equal to then the free charge that is contained within the volume. I hope you can see how this is obtained because realize what we're doing is the volume integral of both sides and then which gives us the Q free on this side and then we use the divergence theorem to change the volume integral into a surface integral. Here they are again, the definition of D, the Gauss's law differential form and Gauss's law integral form. Notice in this equation there's no epsilon zeros. So these are two versions of Gauss's law and they're particularly useful since they make reference only to free charges. Sometimes you can think of it as this way that the free charges are really the only ones we can control by for example applying voltages, putting charge on a sphere, that kind of thing. Both free and polarization charges are sources of E only free charges are sources of D. Because D is given by a modified form of Gauss's law, we can use a lot of the mathematical techniques we use to find E. For a given charge distribution, we can also find D. In free space, where there is no dielectric, the polarization is equal to zero, and therefore D is equal to epsilon zero times E. Okay, so one more time. In free space, P is equal to zero, so we're left only with one term for D. And you just simply multiply by E zero to get D. So let's do a simple example. 
Let's find the D field at a distance r from a point charge Q. What we do is we start with the fact that there's only free charge. So if we stick in the D into the surface integral, we only need to know the Q free. Obviously, we want to use the symmetry to argue that on a sphere of radius r, d is a constant, and d is perpendicular to ds. Well, we've done this problem enough for E fields that we know that that's the case for a point charge. Okay, so we do the integral. Because we have the symmetry, we just multiply by the area of the sphere, which is of radius r, and set that equal to q free. So this over here is the integral, the surface integral, and this is the right-hand side, q free. Well, we can easily solve for d. If we write that as a vector, so this should be a vector, then that'll be q free over 4 pi r squared times the unit vector r. The E field that we know about, this is Coulomb's law. This is equal to q free divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So comparing the e and the d, we see that d is equal to epsilon zero e. This is what it should be because p is equal to zero. So come up here, look at d. If we're going to end up with this, p has to be zero. And that's the case because we're in free space. Well, we th can say that even though it looks like the displacement has properties that are similar to the electric field, there are some important differences. For example, look at the curl of D. It is equal to the following. And I want you to remember that the curl of E is equal to zero. Here, if we expand D and then take the curl of each term, we know that the curl of E is equal to zero. So we put that in. Then what we have is the curl of P. We cannot say is always zero. Sometimes it might be. For example, if p equals zero, that'll be the case. But when, in general, we cannot set it equal to zero, then we would have to conclude that the curl of d is not always zero, contrary to the E field. If that's the case, curl of d is, in general, not equal to zero. And what that means is that there is no potential that generates d. Remember that if we had a curl of E equal to zero, we could find a potential. If you remember the Helmholtz theorem says, if we know the curl and the divergence of a vector, say f, the vector f, then that's sufficient information to uniquely define the vector function f. And if we go back to E, since we know the curl of E is equal to zero, everywhere, and we know the divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon naught, then we have sufficient information to say that the vector function E is uniquely determined, and we can use, therefore, Gauss's law. Capital D, on the other hand, is not uniquely determined by the free charge distribution, but requires additional information, namely the vector P. So we regard P, the polarization, as a material quantity. It has to have dielectric properties in order to get a P. And E is a field quantity induced by the external sources and the sources within the material. Free charges in the material or bound charges. Free charges on the surface and bound charge on the surface. So for that we call D a hybrid quantity. Here's another example. There's a long straight wire carrying a uniform line charge, lambda, surrounded by an insulator out to a radius A. So here's the picture, fairly crude. Here's the cylinder that has insulation in the region from zero to S equal A. Here's the line charge which passes through that. I've chopped these off, but really consider this to go minus infinity to plus infinity or whatever. It's really long. What we're going to do is put a Gaussian surface. Now we're talking about inside the dielectric. So S is less than A. The radius is S, and we'll just take the length, capital L. Let's look at Gauss's law on that surface. So here we have Gauss's law for D, and that's equal to the free charge enclosed by S. 
realize the only free charge is on the wire, lambda. For the Gaussian surface, S, at the radius S, we would have the D inside times the surface area of that Gaussian surface is equal to Q free. So all of this right here is the integral, and we've used the symmetry to bring out D inside. Well, what is Q free? It's just the linear charge density times the length of the Gaussian surface. That's why we use this capital L for the length, because you'll notice that we can cancel it out. So it really doesn't depend on L. Solve for D inside. What we have then is a quantity. Notice that it has no epsilon, zero in it. And it's very similar to the E field. It's lambda over 2 pi s times the unit vector s. Now let's look at the points outside. So s is greater than a. Again, we make a Gaussian surface at radius s outside of the dielectric. And we use symmetry to find d. Remember for d, we only use the free charge. Therefore, if you look at it, d out and d in are going to have the same source of charge, which is the lambda on that wire that goes down the middle. So as a result, when you take that into account and evaluate Gauss's law, you end up with exactly the same function for the D field. That's because D only depends on free charge, and we have this symmetry that's easy to get the integral. OK, what about E? For S greater than A, there's no material out there. There's no insulation. So the polarization vector on the outside is equal to 0. If we go back to our definition of D, we can solve for E outside. And we get D outside minus P outside divided by epsilon 0. This is equal to 0. So we end up with D outside over epsilon 0. But we have that D, and it's equal to this. So the only difference between D and E outside is our epsilon 0 in the, in the denominator. If we go to E inside, we have a problem. Because P inside is not 0. We don't know P. Therefore, we do not know E inside. And so we have to be careful when we think we know how to find E in a dielectric. We've got to know some information about P. The next time, we're going to take up boundary conditions for D and E at interfaces. Now, I know you like boundary conditions. So I've written you a song to the tune of I've Got Sixpence. OK, here goes. I love BCs, jolly, jolly BCs. I love BCs, they'll last me all my life. OK, then you go down as we go roll. Uh, how's it go? As we go rolling, rolling home. Yeah. Okay, so next time, capital D and E, boundary conditions.